Our first guest on the program is attorney at law, Lane Deal. Uh, before the legislative session began, Bill Stubblefield, the admiral and frequent co-host on the program, did a little research and he talked to a local judge who gave us uh, some names for a topic we wanted to make sure was addressed in the uh, Capitol this year. We knew it would be addressed in some form or fashion. That's Child Protective Services with the um, rearrangement of DHHR. So Lane Deal's name was on that list. I gave Lane a call, and she graciously agreed to come in this morning, not just to pick up the tab on the free rate on test kits, but to give us her <laughs> expertise on Child Protective Services in the state. Lane, good morning. Thanks for coming in. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Well, Hopefully you've had a chance to review the reorganization of DHHR, how that all shakes out. I know yours was a voice that lent some input as to how this state needed to better handle the CPS system through DHHR. What are your thoughts? Well, I, I think it's a good start, um, depending upon how it's implemented, of course. I mean, we have, um, there are two ways that this can go. The first way is that people can start focusing on those parts of the uh, DHHR system that they need to focus on so that you have better concentration and efforts related to child protective services health care. The other direction could go in creating silos. That's what you want to try and avoid because a lot of times when you end up in any kind of a CPS situation, um, you're relying on other parts of DHHR to assist you, whether it's economic services or health care, Medicaid, that kind of thing. So you want to avoid the silos, um, but you want to have that concentrated effort. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, you know, we will give it some time and see how things go. A lot of it's in the implementation. It's a lot to try to fix the system in West Virginia. It's, it's it's gotten behind in funding, and even if you gave raises to everybody, there's still no guarantee you could hire the necessary people to do the job and keep them, even if you did hire them. It's, That's right. It's a multifaceted problem. What are some of the recommendations you made when people asked you how to fix this issue? Well, Besides the, what you just addressed. Okay, I think the, one of the problems that I see the most in working with the workers at CPS is just the number of cases that they're trying to manage, particularly here in Berkeley County. Um, we have caseworkers that are sometimes managing up to 100 cases. Um, that is well beyond what the standard is nationally. The Council on Accreditation typically recommends between anywhere between 9 to sometimes up to 20, depending upon the type of CPS case you're dealing with. And we're at 100? And we're at 100. So we have caseworkers that are managing more cases than they can possibly be expected to deal with, and obviously the kids get caught in the crossfire. Matt Miller. What happens to that child that you just mentioned that gets caught in the crossfire i mean when when they're sitting and waiting are they sitting in a foster home they're waiting to get into a foster home they're in some type of a group home are they sometimes still in that very difficult situation that they need to be pulled out of uh it depends um you know, I feel like preserving families is probably the best thing that we could possibly do uh, because we do have a, a lack of available foster care foster care homes and foster care facilities that can take care of the number of kids that we have. Sometimes they languish waiting on placement. Sometimes they're put in placement when they don't need to be in placement. Um, you know, we have a number of kids that are sent out of state. Uh, that is a problem, I think, a lot of times because you don't have the type of oversight that you need when you've got kids that are out of state. The courts do the best they can, and you know, bringing people back before the uh, the judge, you know, usually every sixty, ninety days to see what's going on with those out of state placements. But you know, I have kids um, in Ohio. I've got kids in Florida. I've got kids in Alabama. You're trying to keep up with um, a child that's in a in a system there as well. Um, and as guardian ad litem, I have orders from the court that will allow me to have access to that child, but you're out of jurisdiction, so you've got that issue, uh, and you're just trying to figure out who's the case manager, what's the treatment plan, how many times are they going to have treatment team meetings, are you going to be invited to that? If a child gets hurt, are you going to be notified of that? And a lot of times you don't get those notices that you're supposed to. Now DHHR, CPS, is supposed to not CPS necessarily, but the ongoing caseworker is supposed to be managing that out-of-state placement. But again, you got 100 cases. Mm -hmm. That's the last thing that they're looking at a lot of times are these kids that are out-of-state because they're dealing with kids that are in crisis here in West Virginia. So, 
Uh, you have a caseworker that changes out of state at a facility and they don't know who a guardian ad litem is and your kid can go and be injured and you wouldn't know anything about it if you're not staying on top of that every day, which can be very, um, it's, it's a draining process to try and go through, mm -hmm. uh, just trying to track down who the people are you need to talk to to make sure that your kid is safe. And we are talking about children from what age to what age? Um, I've got children that have been placed that are as young as six. Um, most children that are placed out of state are older. Um, I've got an eight-year-old right now that's out of state. Um, I've got kids that are 15, 16, 17 that are out of state as well. In a lot of these situations, is it an issue of, of behavior and dealing with something that's going on with the child, or, or are most of these cases where there's something going on in the family and it's a need to protect the child? Or does it vary? I, I think it, it, it varies. Um, mm -hmm. You know, a lot of time, you, you're dealing with kids that have had a lot of trauma. And trauma can occur as young as when the child is born and they're taken out of a hospital. You know, they have been in utero. They have, they have developed a sense of what they are, are innately expecting when they're born that is disrupted. They're in a new environment. Um, their brain has to rewire for that. Um, then if, they're, if they get older, two, three years old, and they're removed from the home, all of a sudden the bonds that they've been trying to establish, the, that neurological development, that gets disrupted along with the family being disrupted. So all of those traumas that occur in the brain, you gotta remember when you're dealing with kids you know, from birth to five years old, you're dealing with an incredible amount of neurological development. These kids are, you know, they're um, developing attachments, they're developing um, an understanding of what is safe. They're just, you know, developing basic survival. And when you disrupt them from a home, particularly when they get disrupted more than once, twice, sometimes three times, and we've, I've seen it even more than that, every single time that happens, it's a trauma, their brain's rewiring, trying to develop new attachments. In the process, they can develop a number of um, disorders, oppositional defiant disorder, reactive attachment disorder, attention deficit disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, all of those things start to combine. And then before you know it, the child's showing behaviors there in a foster home that we have, you know, we recruit these foster families. Do we train them adequately? I would like to think that we do, but a lot of times I deal with foster families that really didn't understand what they were getting into when they got into foster care. So they have a kid that's hoarding food. They've got a kid that's banging their head against a wall and call, causing their, their head to bleed. Um, they've got children that are running, and they don't know how to deal with that. And they've got other children in the home at well, as well, sometimes their own children that are you know well-adjusted. So they freak out, and they're ready to disrupt that foster place but so then you add to the trauma for the kid again and then obviously those are the kids that oftentimes find themselves in out-of-state placement because they need a higher level of care matt harvey <clears throat> good morning again lane good morning. um can you just describe how a child would end up in dhhr's care or, or in into the system and going to court for the listeners Sure. So usually what happens is there is a referral that's made. There's a hotline that um, people can call if they're aware of uh, child abuse and neglect. They can report that to the state agency. I don't have that number, but we should get that and, and probably announce that on the program here um, before we finish. But you call the hotline and then CPS is notified and they start to do an investigation. They complete what's called a family functioning assessment which is a, a, a pretty thorough investigation where a CPS worker will go talk to the family. Um, they will talk to the kids. A lot of times the kids are involved in what's called a CAC interview. That's a forensic interview for a child with a, a trained professional who can um, find out what's going on in the home, try to get information without um, prompting the child because you don't want to, um, you don't want to uh, well, first of all, you don't want to re-traumatize the child, but also you want to make sure that you're getting authentic information from the child and that, you know, you're not suggesting things, which sometimes can happen if you don't have a trained professional. Um, once they've completed that assessment, if they find that there's imminent danger, then they can remove the child from the home. If they remove the child from the home, I think they've got 10 days at that point in order to be get, get before the court for a preliminary hearing where the court determines whether or not there was, in fact, imminent danger. 
a petition is typically filed at that point, and then you've got 30 days to adjudicate the parent for child abuse and neglect. Um, the children are then placed in usually foster care. Sometimes there's a kinship provider, which is the preferred placement. If you can find um, a grandparent, an aunt, even what we call fictive kin, um, a best friend's family, you know, uh, parents, somebody, um, a leader at the, at the church, somebody in the education system, somebody who knows the child well that the child can feel comfortable with. Again, you're trying to alleviate as much as possible those addi additional traumas on the child. When you take them out of the home, the child doesn't understand that they're being abused and neglected a lot of times. Sometimes they do, but a lot of times this is just their reality. They don't understand that what's happening is not normal. So when they get disrupted from their home, to them that's a trauma for them, regardless of whether or not it was the right thing to do to take them out of the home. So you want to try and alleviate as much as possible that additional trauma on them by placing them someplace that is safe, preferably someplace that they know and where they have some trust with the adults involved. Um, once you go through the adjudication phase, parents have an opportunity, usually, unless there are some aggravated circumstances, they have an opportunity for an improvement period, at which point DHHR will provide a number of services for the family. If you have drugs involved, then there's, um, you know, the day report center, there are um, residential treatment that can be pursued. Um, they have to demonstrate that they can overcome those conditions that led to the filing of the petition. If there's domestic violence, there's um, uh, community alternatives to violence, there are parenting classes that they have to go through, they have to complete what's called an addiction severity index if there are drugs involved so that we better understand exactly what the nature of their addiction is. And usually that ASI will also give some recommendations on what additional services are needed. They typically have to go through a psychological evaluation as well, and again, there are recommendations that are made there. So there are a number of things that a parent has to do in order to overcome those circumstances. They come back to the court periodically to demonstrate that they have, that they're um, complying with that improvement period. If they're able to successfully comply, then you look at reunification of the children. And you usually have ongoing visitation between the children and their, their parents during a time of an improvement period, unless there's some kind of danger that prohibits that. And, and these aren't short court cases. These go on for many, many months and even years. Yes, absolutely. Um, now, you're supposed to try and get things resolved within 15 months if possible, but a lot of times you find yourself back within the system um, or different kind of things can happen. You can have another child that's born into the into the home in the middle of a, of a case. Um, you may have multiple children involved um, because, you know, if you have one child that's abused, specifically if a child is born drug affected, there are other children in the home those children may be removed as well they may not have the same father as the child that's been recently born so you've got to identify those fathers excuse me <laughs> bumping on into your table you've got to identify those fathers sometimes you have an unknown father and you got to publish for that so yeah it can take it can take a long time to get through the case um, and then if you have an older child then a lot of times you have problems in trying to figure out how to address the um, needs of that child if they're showing trauma signs of trauma and the need for foster families is not being met currently right that is a big problem is having enough foster families but again you want to have I've got some incredible foster families one of the first families I dealt with um, little three-year-old and the parents were wonderful the foster mom in that case was very supportive of the biological mother um, the rights were eventually terminated but that child continues to have an ongoing relationship with the biological mother with the supervision of that foster family that has now adopted that child so uh, it's that's a beautiful situation those are the kind of situations you want to see it's a foster family that's very supportive that understands the traumas that can help and and being a part of the solution for the child um, but then you've got foster families that 
aren't aware of or don't feel it or I guess aren't really as prepared for what they're getting into and they may have a child that comes into the home starts experiencing trauma and demonstrating trauma related behaviors and then you've got disruptions so not only do we need more foster families but we need to know those foster families are prepared adequately trained <clears throat> and that they're in it for the right reasons well I think th- Beyond the obvious financial resources it takes to be a foster family, the emotional toughness it takes. Mm-hmm. You, right. you become bonded with this beautiful three-year-old child and that you have them for six months, and then they're able to go back to their parents. Right. And I think that's something that if anybody's considering fostering, a, being, becoming a foster family, that they would um, – it can be emotionally tough as well. It can be very emotionally tough when you're trying to reunify a family. But again, that's where it can be really helpful and really beautiful if the foster family sees themselves as a support for this child. And if they can develop a relationship with the biological family, a lot of times you have an ongoing relationship even after reunification occurs. Is it a challenge sometimes when we talk about not having enough foster families and you your first example is a beautiful one but do you sometimes lose that foster family after the adoption in other words the emphasis now is is on helping this child as their child and continuing to help that mother but are they then ready to bring more foster children in or are you now going look that was a beautiful situation but now we need another foster family that that happens a lot now with the with the uh, example that i brought up just earlier um they actually have four foster children Mm -hmm. all of whom have been adopted but you know they've at four they've reached their limit that's all that they can really reasonably um, parent and and I certainly understand that Mm -hmm. but yeah you're right in that you're always looking for new foster families because Mm -hmm. there is a limit in how many children that you can adequately take care of. Lane Deal is our guest we are talking about the uh, Child Protective Services System in uh, West Virginia and uh, hopefully the addressing of some of the problems through the reorganization of DHHR. Are you familiar with uh, Valerie Ledford and uh, her story, a local parent who adopted a couple of special needs children and ended up in a uh, nightmare system through foster care in the state of West Virginia. She's, she's, the one uh, child had reactive attachment disorder, became violent, uh, threatening, uh, dangerous to the other child in the house who was his biological sister. She and her husband had adopted these two special needs children and ended up in a nightmare entanglement in the court system further on down the line through rehabilitation centers uh, and protective uh I'm not sure the right way to term you know, the terminology here. The, the the son had to be removed from the house, and it right. became a, a situation where West Virginia didn't have enough options to house this kid. They had to go to another state at one point along the way. Mm-hmm. Uh, does the reorganization of DHHR address any of these shortfalls further on down the line for these children who are foster children, ultimately maybe even adopted by parents who have just been damaged so much in their in their infancy and in their their younger years that they are a, a a violent threat to the family members who are trying to love them um well i i think like i said earlier the reorganization what it does do that i can tell again you're you you have to see the implementation i mean it's one thing to look at the legislation in black and white it's another thing to see how it's implemented through the system Um, It does allow CPS to focus on child protective services and those the well-being of children, which I think is a good thing. I hope that that addresses some of the issues, but I don't think that it it's I think, again, it's a first step. It doesn't address everything that needs to be um, uh, taken into consideration. Like you said, the. the family that you mentioned. I'm not familiar with that particular family, um, but I am very familiar with that kind of story because Mm -hmm. that's not unique. There are a lot of times that you see kids, like I said, when they are experiencing trauma and they start to act out, they can become a danger to other children that are in the home. And then you have to figure out what you're going to do with the child at that point. Um, A lot of families are uncomfortable taking on a child that has those kind of behaviors, especially if they do have other children in the home. So then you're looking at at placement, and we don't have adequate placement facilities within the state. So you're looking a lot of times out of state to place that child, and then you lose control over what's going on in the a lot of times with the out-of-state placement. Um, So I really think looking at 
being able to um, uh, utilize some of our resources to expand the availability of placements within the state um, that are more high level um, for children that are experiencing those kinds of behavioral uh, problems would be a, another thing that we can look at at the, at the legislative level. You mentioned not having adequate facilities in the state. Do you see anything in this legislation or any push within the DHHR that might help to establish some of those facilities that are so desperately needed here so that kids don't have to be sent outside of the state? I know that there's a lot of talk about that. I know okay. there's a lot of people that are in the legislature that are looking at how to um, how to allocate resources so that there are more available more um, in-state facilities that are available. We've lost some facilities that are in-state. Board of Child Care was here, um, you know, providing services, and they've been shut down. Um, so, you know, and, and from what I understand, there were good reasons for that. However, it took away one of the options that we had that was close by. Um, and that presents other problems as well. A lot of times the families that you're talking about do not have a lot of resources themselves. They may not have a car that can get them, you know, from here to Alabama to be able to visit with their child that's been placed there. And so when the child gets to a place where they get what's called a pass, which means, you know, they have earned the ability to go out with their family and be away from the facility for a while, their family might not be able to get there in order for the child to have that pass. So it just, again, um, reinforces the need to have resources that are closer to home for our kids and the families here. Do you feel like many of the recommendations that you made or advice that you gave were adhered to during the reorganization of DHHR? I, I think... I, I feel like I'm being listened to. I mean, the people who I'm talking to have been have been very receptive to my feedback, have called me and asked for additional feedback. And so, um, you know, I, that is reassuring. Um, it, it just takes a long time for, a, I think it's a $7 billion system, is that right? For a $7 billion yeah, system 7. to- 7.5. Exactly, to trickle down into the, I hate to use that term, trickle down, but for that to actually show up um, in the communities and see where that where the changes are taking place, it, it, it's gonna take time to see how that works. I can tell you that we have some tremendous judges that are overseeing our um, abuse and neglect cases right now and have taken a, um, uh, a lot of um, additional time to bring in legislators and people who are within the legislative system and um, higher ups at um, DHHR and they're having regular meetings with these folks and bringing together also service providers and attorneys, guardians, ad litems, um, and doing what they can to try and share uh, information so that we can uh, try to improve the system. The Supreme Court also has a division, the um, Division of Children and Families, that will get involved if there is a, a need to have a higher level of um, uh, of attention placed on a case. Um, we can, there's a court improvement program where you can actually request somebody that's designated by the Supreme Court to, to come in and try to assist if you're having trouble finding a placement, if you've got a problem with an out-of-state placement. Um, I have one situation right now where um, we have people in Charleston that are actually looking at whether or not the state of West Virginia is going to continue to to contract with an out-of-state agency because of some of the problems that we've seen. So, um, you know, it's nice to have those resources, and I think that our judicial system's doing a very good job in trying to keep things together under the circumstances. Wayne, great stuff. Thanks so much. I know we've just scratched the surface of uh, the things we could cover here today, so I'd love to have you back again. I would love to be back. Thank you again for having me. Thank you. And if we can get that number for the hotline, I'll get it for I, you. So I you posted can... it on Facebook. Oh, it's, you did? 1-800-352-6513. Okay. Want to repeat that, Matt? 1-800-352-6513. That's Central Intake at DHHR if you suspect child abuse. Thank you very much.